spiritual life in the Holy Spirit. And um, we pointed out that certain works of the Spirit happen one time, the moment we believe, and other mysteries are ongoing for our spiritual life. And this morning, I want to focus on one specific area of um, the spiritual life in which we involved in the spiritual warfare. You've been given a, an outline, rather extensive outline. I'll be following the outline somewhat, but not um, precisely, because this outline covers a version of this teaching which takes me about three hours to teach. And we're not going to devote three hours this morning on this, so I'm going to be a bit more selective, so I'll be a bit differently organized than what's on the outline. The outline must still prove somewhat um, helpful in dealing with this topic. So with me, will you please turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. I'll have to remember again to speak slower than I usually do because this, uh, using a simultaneous translation. But again, if I start forgetting myself, just somebody wave at me. As I mentioned, I learned my English in Brooklyn, New York. And in Brooklyn, you have to say what you want to say quickly and then make a run for it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so often I'm not, I'm not living in Brooklyn anymore. Uh, elsewhere in the North America, they speak a slow English, and I sometimes forget myself. We, when we deal with a warfare in general, there's usually more than uh, one type of front. So what certain types of fronts have, be, they have to be handled by the army. That type of front has to be handled by the Navy, another front by the Air Force. And in the spiritual warfare, there are three specific fronts. And you find them here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you did you make alive when you were dead through your trespasses and sins, when you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the powers of the air, of the spirit, who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once lived in the lust of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, who by nature shortened of wrath even as the rest." And notice there are three specific fronts here. The first front is the world, and by world we mean the world system under Satan's authority. The second front is Satan and the demonic forces in verse 2. And the third front is the flesh, which is what we are by nature here in verse 3. And just as in a human literal warfare, different fronts must be fought in different ways, by the same token, in the spiritual warfare, these three different fronts must be handled in different ways. So basically what I want to do is to go through the three fronts, explain what they, were, what they are, how they war against us, and then um, after we do that, we'll go through the three fronts again and see how they affect our spiritual warfare and how we can gain victory within that frame of reference. Let's begin then with the first front, which is the flesh, and by the flesh we mean the sin nature. The sin nature is something we inherit from Adam, that, that, that's passed down through our parents. So from Adam, through all generations, and we are born with the sin nature, which we inherit from our biological father and mother. And by definition, the sin nature is the capacity to serve and to, and to please oneself the capacity to serve and to please the flesh, to please oneself. It's a capacity that leaves God out. And a good definition is the capacity to do all those things, good things or bad things, that leave God out. The capacity to do all those things, both good and bad, that leave God out. It's not necessarily that um, everything um, is either good or bad. Some things are that way. But other things by themselves are neutral. And it's how we use it, whether we are building on the basis of the sin nature or the new nature. And besides the, uh, the term sin nature, there are two other names for this entity. And one common name in scripture is the flesh. As Romans chapter 7, verse 14 and verse 18, Romans 7, verses 14, 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and many other places. And the flesh is sometimes used literally of our skin, but it's often used more of the 
an immaterial part of man, the sin nature, something that is within us that uh, tries to control us and move us to commit acts of sin. Now, another name for this uh, sin nature or the flesh is the old man. And you find the old man mentioned in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, Romans 6, 6, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, Ephesians 4, 22, and Colossians chapter 3, verse 9, Colossians 3, 19. And the phrase, the old man, uh, takes us back to the source of the sin nature, the source of the capacity the leaves got out. It takes us back to Adam, and we inherit our sin nature from Adam, uh, through our uh, biological parents. Now keep in mind, when we're unbelievers, this was the only capacity we had. And every unbeliever has only one capacity. No matter what he does, whether it is very bad things, whether it's neutral things, or it's very good things, it leaves God out of the equation. And therefore, ultimately, whether it's good, neutral, or uh, bad, the purpose is to please the sin nature and to fulfill the desires of the flesh. Now, when we become believers, we are regenerated and we're given a new nature. And now we have the capacity to do those things that will honor God, that will glorify God, and that we can serve God with righteousness. We do not lose the sin nature, it's still there. But we no longer have any obligation to obey it. And we still have the old man, but in addition to the old man, we have the new man. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 24, Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, and Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10, Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10. So the unbeliever has only one capacity. He has no option. No matter what he does, good or bad, will leave God out of the equation. Believer has two capacities. He has an option. So he can serve God with uh, righteousness, so he can please the flesh. And now that we have two, these, not that we have the two capacities, not that we have the two natures, they are in constant conflict with each other. Turn first of all to uh, Romans chapter seven. Romans chapter seven. And Paul describes his uh, stages in his early days of faith after he became a believer. How he found himself in conflict. Look at chapter 7, verse 15, Romans 7, verse 15. But that which I do I know not, for not what I would that I do practice, but I hate that I do. But what I would not that I do, I consent unto law it is good. So now there's no more I that do it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but to do that which is good is not. For the good which I would I do not, but the evil which I would not I do practice. But what if I would not, but if what I would not that I do, it is no more I, I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then the law to mean who would do good, evil is present. For I delight in the law of God, after the inward man. But I see a different law of my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity under the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me out of this body of this death? I thank God for Yeshua the Messiah, Lord. So then of myself, with the mind I indeed serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And as Paul mentions his struggle in his early spiritual life days, how he knew that the sin nature was in him, we also had a new nature. He struggled to keep on doing that which is right and that which is righteous, but also found himself falling back into doing that which is unrighteous and that which is uh, in, in uh, leaving God out. And it keeps reminding us, the sin that dwells in me, the sin that dwells in me, that's the sin nature of the old man. So with regeneration, we do not lose our sin nature. We do not lose the old man. But we no longer have the obligation to obey the sin nature, to obey the old man. We now have the uh, choice to make, uh, make the right choice. And as we grow in the spiritual life, as we move from milk to meat, from immaturity to maturity, 
if we're progressing towards maturity, we'll be living more and more a consistent spiritual lifestyle, not, not continually falling into sin. Now, we'll never stop sinning in this life. And there are those who teach we can reach sinless perfection in this life. There are some churches that teach that. When I meet somebody that tells me they finally reached perfection and they finally attained a level where they are sinlessly perfect, man says, may I talk to your wife? <laughs> and she usually knows there's other things that simply would not clear them of any sin. Now look at the shorter version, look at Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5 verse 16, Galatians chapter 5 verse 16, but I say walk by the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are contrary to one to the other, that she may not do the things that she would. The, and what he said extensively in Romans 7, he says more um, concisely in, in Galatians, that uh, there was a struggle going on, a warfare going on between the new nature and the old nature, between the new man and the old man. And um, he points out in verses 19 through 21, 19 to 21, the various uh, works of the flesh and people guilty of these things are functioning on the basis of the flesh. But in verses 22 and 23, 22 and 23, he lists the fruit of the Spirit and those who mature more and more shown these fruit of the Spirit as we become more and more conformed to the image of the Son of God. So again, when we deal with the two capacities, it's not simply separate acts that some belong to this and some belong to that. Obviously, many actions are in the neutral zone, like recreation. And if a recreation life is not under the Spirit's control, it's under control of the flesh. So as we recreate, either we, we include God in the equation or we leave God out. Then the spiritual warfare, and what we see some believers, what happened to some believers, is they keep habitually falling into their old sin, the sinful acts, the same problem over and over again, and um, they keep on living with the old capacity. And that's a situation we'll come back to a bit later. Let's go on to the second front of the spiritual warfare, Satan and demons. And turn now to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. There are various ways that uh, Satan chooses to um, attack us. And one of his major ways of attacking believers, not so much unbelievers in this manner, but believers, is what I call this counterfeit program. Now, when Satan led his revolt against God back in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, he declared five I wills. And his fifth I will was, I will make myself like the Most High. I will make myself like the Most High. Even he knew he could not merely become the Most High by wishing it, so he said, I will make myself just like him and the desire to become like God that brought about his fall. And when he tempted uh, Eve in the garden, he, he used the same strategy. And he told that if you will partake of this tree, you will have a knowledge of good and evil, and you will be like God. And, and Eve's desire to become like God caused about the, the fall of her, then Adam, and the fall of man. And when the final uh, man of Satan rules the world, the Antichrist, we read then if he, in the Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse three and four. Second Thess two, three and four. He will sit in the temple of God, setting himself forth as God, and you see the mind of Satan, desire to be like God. Any time we try to take control of our lives for all by ourselves, every time we try to exercise a, a will that is a will to be like God. We're no longer reflecting the mind of the Messiah, we're reflecting the mind of Satan. In becoming like God, what he has inaugurated is a counterfeit program. 
Now keep in mind, a counterfeit dollar is not an obvious phony dollar. It's not like Monopoly money. Counterfeit money looks like real money. So much like real money that in our lifetime, all of us at one time may have even handled counterfeit money without knowing it because few of us are trained to tell the difference between the counterfeit and the genuine. It takes those that have been so trained to tell the difference. Now look at the nature of this kind of a program here in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Chapter 11, verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled even his craftiness, your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity and the purity that is taught Messiah. For if he that comes preaches another Yeshua whom we did not preach, if you receive another spirit which you did not receive, another gospel that you did not accept, you do well to avoid him. In verse 4, he labels three things by the word another. Another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. Now, in some English relations, it's always the same word, but in Greek, there are two different Greek words, and they carry a slightly different shade of meaning. The first Greek term means another of the same kind, another of the same kind, and the second Greek word means another of a different kind another a different kind. Now with that in mind, I want to reread verse 4, and I'll translate a bit more literally from the Greek text. Quote, For if he that comes preaches another Jesus of the same kind, whom we did not preach, or receive another spirit of a different kind, which he did not receive, or another gospel of a different kind, and so on. Now the gospel being presented is another gospel of a different kind. And the source is another spirit of a different kind. But the Yeshua, the Jesus being presented, is another Jesus of the same kind, one that sounds like and seems like the Jesus of Scripture, but a carefully disguised counterfeit. Let's skip down to verse 13. Verse 13, For such men are false apostles, the steeple workers, fashioning themselves into apostles of Christ, and no marvel. Even Satan fashions himself into an angel of light. Now, those who are pro propagating this counterfeit Jesus are declared to be false apostles, but notice that is not the way they appear. They fashion themselves to sound like and seem like real ministers of the Messiah. And by so doing, they are reflecting the true Lord Satan, who is the angel of this darkness, but he fashions himself to appear as an angel of light. So the nature of the counterfeit program is to propagate a Jesus similar to one of scripture and therefore get many believers caught up into various elements and movements where they fail to mature. Now turn to Matthew chapter 7 we'll see just how far this counterfeit program can, is, and will be carried. Matthew chapter 7. The strategy of Satan is to keep unbelievers from coming to faith, but when he fails to um, stop people from coming believers, his next strategy is to try to keep the new believer from maturing in the faith, to keep him in the milk but not move on to the meat, stay immature, not move on to maturity. And one of the ways he, he strategizes this is to keep um, people uh, being caught up into various sensational experiential movements, being caught up in a counter for Jesus and not paying attention to the written word of God. Now chapter 7 verse 22 will show how far the counterfeit program can be carried. 722, many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy by your name and by your name cast out demons and by your name do many mighty works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me that work iniquity. Notice what they could accomplish in the name of a counterfeit Jesus. Three things. Prophesy events that came to pass. Uh, do, um, cast out demons. Do many mighty works like miracles of healings. Yet Messiah will say to them in that judgment day, I never knew you. That is why uh, if we're not careful, if we simply assume if the supernatural happens and must be of God, then we can be caught up in the kind of a program. As we shall see a little bit later, the final test case is not the mere existence of the supernatural. Satan can duplicate many of the miracles of God. 
the actual test cases conformity to the written word of God as well as being said, taught, and done consistent with scripture. So one strategy he has is to have a counter program to try to keep new believers in particular to stay immature and move from immaturity into carnality. A second way he does so for all of us is by means of temptation. And I look at 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter five verse uh, eighteen uh, verse eight rather. First Peter five verse eight. Be sober, be watchful. You have a sorry the devil as one lion walks about seeking whom he may devour. He's walking around seeing who he may devour. This is the strategy of his temptation. And in First Corinthians chapter ten verse thirteen. First Corinthians ten thirteen. Paul reminds us that all believers suffer this uh, strategy of Satan tempting us to do, commit acts of sin. Another way by which he was against believers is for some believers he takes on satanic control. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, Ephesians 4, 27, Paul says, do not give the devil a place. Do not give the devil a place. The Greek word for place is the Greek word, Greek word for beachhead. A beachhead. What's a beachhead? When an army begins to attack enemy territory, they first in the force to capture some territory within enemy territory, to capture some ground within enemy territory, then provide cover fire for the reinforcements coming in from the rear. It's always um, the beachhead is always control within the territory. And the point is that sometimes believers fall into a situation where Satan has taken control from within. The context of Ephesians 4.27 talks about habitual, unconfessed sin. And believers who continue to live in habitual, unconfessed sin can give the devil a place and it's a control from within. And um, the problem with so many believers is that some have given into temptation frequently and some have been caught up into a counterfeit Jesus, and some have fallen to these demonic control. This can happen when believers begin to practice seances, the wrong time of wrong forms of meditation, like Eastern meditation, yoga, hypnotism, Ouija boards, um, and so on. These are various ways they can fall into this uh, kind of a trap. And so the problem we have with this uh, second front is some believers just consistently either have fallen under Satan's control or keep falling into temptation or got, got caught up into a new movement that simply is very sensational but doesn't mature them in the faith. Now for the third front is the world and turn now to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Now, by the world, we mean the world system, the world system that keeps trying to program our minds. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, 1 John 2, verse 15, John writes, Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the vainglory of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. Now, what he points out in these three verses is three basic points. First of all, in verse 15, you cannot both love the world and love the Father at the same time. Either you love the world or you love the Father, but trying to love both will contradict each other. Secondly, in verse 16, the things of the world are not of the Father. The things of the world are not of the Father. And thirdly, in verse 17, the, the world is transitory, it is temporary, it is under divine judgment. And he's describing what the world system is, and it's a system that is under Satan's control. 
as in um, John 12, 31. John 12, 31, he's the prince of this world. And in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, 1 John 5, 19, the whole world is in the lap of the evil one. The Greek word for world is the word cosmos, K-O-S-M-O-S, K-O-S-M-O-S. It refers to a, 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 a ordered world in contrast to chaos, this is an organized world. And so he has taken control of the world and he has organized it to be an anti-God world system. And so contrary to chaos, it is cosmos organized, uh, being in order. In fact, the, uh, the English word cosmetic comes from the same Greek word cosmos. And what's the connection? Because the woman gets up in the morning, she uses cosmetics to bring order out of chaos. <laughs> And that's your connection. <laughs> but the point is the world is continually programming our minds. Yes, I have a wife. <laughs> our minds are continually being programmed to think the way the world is thinking. Years ago, Life magazine had a special edition on the seas of the world. It was devoted only on the study of the world's oceans. And I was a subscriber to Life magazine, and I turned to the first page, and the statement was made, the sea out of which all life evolved. Now that phrase, out of which out, out of all, uh, the sea out of which all life evolved, had nothing to do with the rest of the magazine. But there was a little incident there, a little way that the world is trying to program to think as the way the world is thinking. There is no creator, there's no creation, it is all evolution. And so the world is programming us to think, to act, to conform to a system, to be fashioned according to this world. It's a struggle for the mind, according to Colossians chapter 2, verses 8, 20 to 22. Colossians 2, verses 8, 20 to 22. And, um, this, and as you watch different um, TV shows and different movies and so on, there's always a matter of programming that wants us to think the way the world is thinking. Now, the, what the believer's position is since we have been saved is uh, three things. First of all, the Bible teaches we have been positionally taken out of the world. We are no longer of this world system. And that point is made in John chapter 15, verse 19, John 15, 19, and chapter 17, verse 6, 17, 6. Secondly, we've been separated from the world by a judicial act of God. And once we became believers, God judicially declared us to be separate from the world system. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, Galatians 6, 14. But now we have been sent back into the world to bear witness, to witness of God's plan, God's program, God's way of thinking. In John chapter 17, verse 11 and verse 18, John chapter 17 verses 11 and 18. So we are no longer of the world, we're still in the world. As long as we're living, we're in this world, we'll be confronted by the world system, and this world will continue trying to reprogram us from our mind to take us to think, to make us think the way the world is thinking. The whole focus is on the struggle for the mind. And some believers have been so programmed, they're thinking the way the world is thinking. They lost the struggle for the mind. And therefore, these are the three fronts of the spiritual warfare. And again, we now have to deal how to, how to deal with each of these um, fronts. Let's go back then to the flesh and turn to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Now, when we deal with the sins of the flesh... We have to deal with the issue of confession. And the first chapter, first John 1 verse 9, he says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the emphasis in scripture is that once we are aware of a sin we have committed, we should confess the sin to God. In Greek, the word confess means to say the same thing about it. To say the same thing about it. 
And the point is we must say the same thing about it that God says. We don't simply tell God we did this. He already knows that. Nothing is hid from him. But um, we must recognize that God called it a sin. We must recognize it to be sin. So confession is more than repeating what we did. It's a seeking of re uh, uh, act of repentance and seeking for forgiveness. Now the timing when we should be um, um, confessing our sin is the moment we become aware of it. But the Bible gives us two other time elements and Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26 Ephesians 4.26, Paul writes, Do not let the sun go down on your anger. You can be angry, but don't let the sun go down on your anger. So certainly before bedtime, we should make a confession of our sins. You might get better dreams that way. But another time element is given in 1 Corinthians 11. Let's turn to it, 1 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> First Corinthians 11, and this is a connection with partaking of the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper. He writes in verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man prove himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For if he that eat, for it, for he that eats and drinks eats and drinks judgment upon himself if he discern not the body, for this cause many among you are weak, and sickly, and not a few sleep. But we should discern be, and if we discern ourselves, we should not be judged. He points out that we must be careful how we partake of the bread and the cup shown for the Lord's body, the Lord's blood. And he points out that we must not partake of it in an unworthy manner. And one way to partake of it in an unworthy manner is to be living in sin and having a life that is, has confessed the sin before the Lord. So another time element that before partaking of the communion, we must um, deal with the issue of our sinful, of our acts of sin and deal with the confession of it to receive uh, practical forgiveness from God. Now the problem of the vicious cycle is that many, many believers, they confess it and, f and commit it again. Over and over again, confess the same sin, commit the same sin, confess the same sin, and commit the same sin. And this may be due to the second problem. It could be that Satan has gotten some area of control in their lives, and therefore, if we keep on only confessing, it's like someone um, to, uh, being in a situation where um, uh, say someone is choking us. Instead of kicking the person choking us, we keep kicking ourselves. That won't help us in surviving the choking. At some point, we have to deal with the person choking. We just keep on confessing and don't move on. Then um, we're kicking ourselves. We need to kick something else. Let's move on then to the um, next um, issue, and that is dealing with Satan. And the key element for Satan, the Bible uses the word resistance. Turn first of all to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. James chapter 4 verse 7. James 4 verse 7. Be subject therefore unto God... But resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The first thing is, be subject, therefore, unto God. And that's what happens when we confess our sins. When we sin against him, we are rebelling against God. But by means of confession, we submit ourselves back unto God's authority. Then secondly, resist the devil. And if we resist the devil, God promises he will flee from you. Exactly how we resist, we'll talk about momentarily. But now go back to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. We read verse 8 earlier, pointing out this, that he is walking around seeking who may devour. And now look at verse 9. Whom withstand or stand against or resist 
In your faith, learn that the same sufferings are accomplished in your brethren who are in the world. And he points out where Satan goes around seeking me devour, our responsibility is to resist, to stand against. But just how do we do that? Let's go to a third passage where the word stand against or resist is used three different times. That's in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. In the USA, it has become rather popular to have these spiritual war conferences that many attend. And often only focus on the satanic front, ignoring the flesh and the world. But when they deal with the satanic front, instead of teaching you how to resist them by means of scripture, they teach you how to resist by means of uh, rituals. And they say, we, you have to march around Satan seven times. You want to cast them out of a building, march around the building seven times. Or if you want to evangelize an area, march around the area seven times. You must, you must uh, march around them, you must bind them, and so on. If we have the authority to um, bind Satan, let's all together and simply bind them out of the universe and be done with it already. But people don't follow the logic of the system. And um, in the spiritual warfare conference, the, the conferences when they get to the armor of God, which is found here in Ephesians 6, they tell you when you get up in the morning, you should, you should go to the ritual of putting on the armor. So get up and put on the helmet, put on the breastplate, put on the belt, put on the shoes, and so on. And my question for them is, if you have to put on the armor by a ritual when you got to bed, when you get up from bed, why did you take it off when you went to bed? <laughs> you think God, uh, God, Satan takes a nap the same time you do? Now, when Yeshua uh, was, was tempted by Satan, how did Yeshua uh, resist? He didn't do all those things you see on Christian television. He didn't rebuke Satan, bind him, walk around him seven times. What he did was quote scripture relevant to that issue. And the three different temptations, he had the appropriate scripture to deal with it. And that is, the, that is the actual principle. Satan won't be scared away by different rituals we may perform. Rather, he will be, he'll be chased away by way, by way of resistance to a scripture. So obviously, you must, we must do two things. First of all, we must study scripture because we cannot apply what we do not know. On the other hand, knowledge alone can make us proud, and therefore, it must also be applied so on one hand, there is knowledge, but there must also be the application of the knowledge to our daily living. And by study of Scripture and the application of Scripture, that is the way we resist Satan. That's the point we're about to see here in Ephesians chapter 6. In chapter 6, verse 10, he says, be strong in the Lord. And last week, among the ministries we spoke about is the ministry of spirit baptism, where the moment we believe, the Spirit baptizes us into the body of the Messiah, and that's how we become in the Lord. And so Paul uses many phrases in a very technical manner. In Jesus, in Christ, in Christ Jesus, in Jesus Christ, in Him, in whom, or here in the Lord. And by being in the Lord, that means we need to learn and recognize what it means to be positionally in Him. As I mentioned last week, there are 33 things which are not true of us, not because of what we really are like, because of what we are in Him. It's called positional truth, and there are 33 things involved beyond our scope to be able to see here, but it's available through our Yalkanda here in manuscript form that makes it available. But that's how we, how we learn to be strong in the Lord. And... Um, how this deals with Satan, he points out in verse 11, and notice for the first time he uses the word resist. He'll be used it three times here. And in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to resist or stand against the wells of the devil. And so the purpose of the armor is to be able to resist Satan. And in verse 12, he tells us the real enemy is not flesh and blood. The real enemy out there is Satan and demonic forces that uses uh, flesh and blood to attack us, but in also it is a war, not a one-time battle. 
And then in verse 13, he talks again, mentions the purpose of the armor. And for the second time, he says to resist or to stand against or to withstand. And then in verse 14, for the third time, therefore resist, therefore stand. So three times over, the purpose of the armor is to be able to resist Satan. When you get to the pieces of the armor in verses 14 through 17, in most commentaries, they tell you what these different uh, weapons had uh, relevant to the Roman soldier, what it did for the Roman soldier. But often they stop there and miss the point. Now, if you have one of these Bibles that gives a column of scripture on the side of the footnote, what you will notice is every piece of armor except one is a phrase out of the Old Testament. Every piece of armor except one is a phrase from the Old Testament. For example, in verse 14, loins girded with truth. That's from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 5. Isaiah 11, verse 5. Breastplate the righteousness. That's Isaiah chapter 59, verse 17. Isaiah 59, 17. Food, the feet shod with the gospel of peace. That's Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. Isaiah 52, 7. Also Nahum chapter 1, verse 5. Nahum 1, 5. And then he mentions um, in verse 16, the shield of faith. That's the one that is not found in the Old Testament. And then verse 17, the helmet of salvation. That is in Isaiah 59, verse 17. Isaiah 59, 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Isaiah 11, verse 4. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4. Chapter, 42, verse, chapter 49, verse 2. 49.2 and Hosea chapter 6 verse 5. Isaiah 6, Hosea chapter 6 verse 5. So the piece of Yama focuses on different facets of scripture. And so he's simply making the same point taught by the three gospels when dealing with the temptation of the Messiah. The means of resisting Satan is to, is to apply specific scripture for the specific type of temptation or attack. And therefore, we are again obligated to study the Word of God and also to apply the Word of God in our daily living. The spiritual warfare is not all that complicated. It's a, it's a war. It's not a complicated way of, of uh, fighting the war, but it does take self-discipline. It does take setting time aside to study the Word of God takes time to apply it. And when we are confronted by a specific issue, a specific problem, a simple concordance will help us find the verses relevant to that issue, and then we can begin to study those verses in their context and apply them. And um, in verse 18, he points out, all this done should be accomplished with prayer. All this should be accomplished with prayer. Now, my, my brother-in-law works for the American Secret Service, and the American Secret Service under the United States Treasury Department that concerns itself with counterfeit U.S. dollars. And when he was being trained to tell the difference between the counterfeit and the genuine dollars, he was, they did not begin with counterfeit money. He had to study all of the U.S. dollars in the various denominations. They got to know the genuine article very well. Because while, uh, while the counterfeits look very much like the genuine, they tend to have a flaw. Maybe the wrong paper was used. Maybe the wrong ink was used. Maybe the wrong design in some obscure corner of the bill, but it's not an obvious flaw. So, thanks, so you must know the genuine very well. Without being told when he was slip counter for money, he was able to spot the flaw only because of his knowledge and of the genuine. And that principle applies to us in this facet of the spiritual warfare. God's plan, God's program, God's way of doing things are clearly spelled out in the written word of God. And therefore, our first obligation is to get to know the genuine program well. And then we're confronted by a counterfeit program. We'll be able to spot the flaw because of our knowledge of the genuine. And that's the way we deal with the second front of the spiritual warfare. Let's go on to the third front, the world. And the issue of the world was the programming of our minds to get us to think the way the world is thinking. And the uh, counter program is to reprogram our minds to get us the way God is thinking. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, Ephesians 5, 11, Paul writes, 
Do not fellowship with the world in the area of the deeds of darkness. Don't fellowship with the world. James chapter 1, verse 27, James 1, 27, we need to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 31, 1 Corinthians 7, 31, do not abuse the things of the world. But the key solution is found in Romans chapter 12, so let's look at it. Romans chapter 12. In the first 11 chapters of Romans, he's been primarily theological, showing how God has provided for us in three key areas, in justification, the past facet of our salvation, the more we believe we've been justified, declared righteous. Then secondly, the, fast, the present facet of our salvation, sanctification, where more and more he's conforming us to the image of the Son of God. And then thirdly, in the future, there'll be glorification. And because of all that God has done, nothing will separate us from the love of God. And in chapters 9 to 11, he also pointed out, although it appears that God's promises to Israel have remained unfulfilled, in the program of God it will be fulfilled, and the day is coming when all Israel will be saved. And now he begins to do the practical application in chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, what for? Because of what he wrote in chapters 1 to 11. I beseech you for, for that reason, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. Now, this is the first step to discipleship. And um, salvation comes merely by accepting the gospel by grace to faith, but discipleship requires another type of commitment. That once we see all that God has done for us, we need to present our bodies a living sacrifice for spiritual work for the Lord. And that begins the first step of discipleship. That's where we begin to grow from milk to meat. Then he says in verse 2, And be not fashioned or programmed according to this world, but be transformed by the renewing or reprogramming of your mind that you may prove us the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And just as on one side the world is programming us to get us to think the way the world is thinking, we need to reprogram our minds to get us the way God is thinking. In Greek it's a present tense emphasizing continuous action. Keep on reprogramming your minds. It's not a one-time event. The presenting of the body in verse 1 is a one-time event, but the reprogramming is ongoing for our whole spiritual life here on earth. And the purpose of reprogramming our mind continually is to avoid becoming conformed to this world, to stop accepting the standards of the world, to maintain the standards of God. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5, Paul points out we must bring every thought into captive obedience to the Messiah. Captive obedience to the Messiah. Our whole thinking in life needs to have been under Messiah's control. And Philippians chapter 4 verse 8, Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 tells us what we should be uh, thinking about. And again, the Word of God is how we put on the armor. And often it's not so much getting people into Word, but as much as getting the Word into the people. And so how do we get the um, Word into us? And keep in mind, and we only since the invention of the printing press was it possible for every believer to have his own copy of the Bible. What happened before then? Before then, from biblical times onward, people used two methods. First of all, memorizing the text. And although we now have our own Bible, we should still practice memorizing text of Scripture. And um, memorizing them, we can see what it says, but it's also important that we do not do what I call shotgun memorizing a verse here, a verse there, because it's too easy to pull a verse out of context and make it mean something other than what it really means. So always memorize at least a paragraph, and most Bibles today show you where the paragraph begins and ends, uh, at least a paragraph. 
And by memorizing paragraphs at a time, every verse is put in the context so we did not misapply it. But then going beyond memorizing, the emphasis is on meditation. Meditate the wealth of memorized to see how it could affect our regular lives and daily lives. And so God told Joshua as he took our leadership after Moses died, um, Moses gave us the law, the five books of the Bible, where all the five books of the Bible at that time were the five books of Moses. And God told Joshua, meditate on this law that Moses gave us day and night. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Chapter Joshua 1 verse 8. Psalm 119 verse 11. Psalm 119 verse 11. The longest psalm in the book of Psalms. Every verse, about five verses, mention the word of God. And in verse 11 he says, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And later in verse 97, he says, upon your word do I meditate. It was taught in the Old Testament, this truth is also taught by the New. John chapter 15, verse 7, my word abides in you. And in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, Colossians 3, 16, let the word of God abide in you richly. The word abide means to make, make your home. Let the word of God make his home in us. And in 1 John chapter 2, verse 14, 1 John 2, 14, he tells the readers, the word abides in you, the word has made its home in you, and you have overcome the evil one. And notice they overcome the evil one by the word of God, not by different rituals. So the process is, um, just go ahead, we should continue memorizing scripture generally, but we run into a specific issue that we're being tempted to do or a conflict that we have, we should memorize scripture specifically dealing with that area. And therefore we can then pray that prayer back to God, pray that verse back to God and gain victory. Let's summarize what, we, what, what, what we've been saying. Concerning the flesh, the solution is confession. 1 John 1.9, 1 John 1.9. Concerning the devil, the um, issue is resistance. James chapter 4, verse 7. James 4, 7. Concerning the world, the issue is resistance. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. One more question. When we're, when we're dealing with an issue, how do we know whether it's coming from the world, the flesh, or the devil? How do we know? Sometimes we do. Often we don't. So go through all three steps anyway. Let's confess it, let's resist Satan on it, let's reprogram our minds about it. And by this way we're well, we're well um, confronting all three fronts of our spiritual warfare. So again, it's not complicated, but it'll take self-discipline to... Locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. You can also reach us through our website at www.arielcanada.com. Again, the phone number is 1-888-685-5902 or locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. Website address is www.arielcanada, all one word, A-R-I-E-L, Canada.com. Be blessed. Shalom.